one of the nice things about um, polar curves is that we can extend the ideas we've learned when we did parametric func equations um, to polar curves. Now it's very important to keep in mind the derivative you're looking at. There are a lot of derivatives you can talk about when you're doing polar curves. You can talk about dr d theta and you might want to think about what that rate of change gives you. Um, you've got dy dx um, which is a different which is a different one. And so the nice thing is that dy dx is going to follow the same format as when we did parametric and that is that it's just dy d theta divided by dx d theta. All right, so it's identical to parametrics. And that's because you can express polar equations as parametric equations. So you, because you might wonder now, like, what do you mean dy d theta dx d theta? When we do, um, when we do polar functions, um, everything's always written as r, as uh, you know, r in terms of theta, right? Like r is always a function of theta, as we've seen in <clears throat> prior examples. The equations always have r, and then the other side has theta in them. So why are we talking about dy d theta and dx d theta? Where do those come in? Well, if you combine the fact that you know, r is going to be a function of theta and the fact that we can express x as being r cosine of theta and y being r sine of theta if we're focusing on the Cartesian forms of these uh, of these points. Well, making a quick substitution allows us to just take take the whatever r is as a function of theta and put it in there to get these parametric equations. And this is probably the first time you've ever seen a parametric equation where the parameter is not t, right? So most of the time everyone says, well, t is just time. But parametr parameters don't have to be just time. You know, the t's aren't the only parameter you can use. This is a parametric equation now in terms of theta. All right, so just quickly, for example, I mean, if I had, um, so for example, let's just say, you know, r equaled, r equal to, um, or let's use this one here. This is actually r equal to 4 sine of 2 theta, it looks like. That's what this, this rose petal graph, that's its equation for sure. And uh, if you wanted, so if you wanted to graph this on your calculator, you could go into, um, you could just go into polar mode and put in r equals 4 sine of 2 theta, but you could also go into parametric mode and since x equals r, since x equals r cosine of theta, you can write this as a, um, r cosine of theta. But since r is a function, it would be four sine of two theta. That's our r times cosine of theta, and our y coordinate would be four sine of two theta times sine of theta. So you could also graph this parametric, these parametric equations and get the same picture. And that'll let us do calculus more easily because we already know how to find derivatives in parametric form. So let's look at an example of how we can um, find derivatives and slopes of tangent lines to polar curves. So here we have the, the polar curve r equals 4 cosine of theta. We want to know the slope of the tangent line to the curve at uh, theta equals pi over 4. So remember that slope of the tangent line <clears throat> in pretty much all contexts means this derivative dy dx. Because right, there are other derivatives floating around here. There's dr d theta, which means something different. Um, <clears throat> but d dy dx will always mean the slope of the tangent line. So if you rotate pi over 4 or 45 degrees, that brings you to this point on the curve, and I think we can probably guess that the answer should be, after we do it analytically, that looks like a horizontal tangent, so our guess is going to be that the slope is equal to zero, so I'll put a question mark there, but that seems likely. Um, and uh, let's, let's do it analytically using the fact that we know, um, we know that we want dy dx, 
So we want dy dx. Um, and we want it uh, at theta equals to pi over 4. So before we do that, let's remind ourselves that dy dx is going to be dy d theta divided by dx d theta. Now in order to get dy d theta and dx d theta, we first need to express the x and y coordinates as functions of theta. And we do that using um, this substitution that we looked at in the last slide. So again, if x is considered to be r cosine of theta, which we know it is, well r is a function of theta, so I'll just substitute 4 cosine of theta in for x, uh, in for r rather. So this becomes 4 cosine of theta times cosine of theta, which we could think of as 4 cosine squared of theta. And now I have an expression for the x-coordinate of that point as a function of theta. Similarly, y would be r sine theta, which would be 4 cosine theta sine theta once we substitute. All right, so now I've got... Now I've got an expression for uh, x and y as functions of theta. So now let's go down here and find dy d theta and dx d theta. So dy d theta is just the derivative with respect to theta of 4 cosine times sine. Now there are some identities you can use. For instance, you could pull out a 2 and call this 2 times 2 cosine theta sine of theta. And the reason that might be helpful is because it turns out that the that 2 sine theta cosine theta is an identity and it's equal to the sine of 2 theta. And taking the derivative of the sine of 2 theta is easier because you don't have to worry about the product rule. But I'll just assume you don't remember that and let's just use the product rule here. So the derivative of this would be um, we'll just take out a 4 too. 4 times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, times sine, plus cosine times the derivative of, of uh, sine, which is cosine, which we can re uh, simplify to 4, uh, or negative 4 sine squared of theta, plus 4 cosine squared of theta. And similarly, dx d theta is going to be the derivative with respect to theta of 4 cosine squared theta, which I want to write like this because it's just usually easier to think like this when taking derivatives. So now I know that derivative is 8 cosine of theta to the 1 times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine of theta. Now, we want to evaluate these guys at, at pi over 4. So let's do that. So again, we're going to evaluate this at pi over 4. So if this evaluated at pi over 4. Let's see if I can move this a little bit. And right here, if I plug in pi over 4, I'm going to get negative 4 sine squared of pi over 4. plus 4 cosine squared of pi over 4. Now the cosine and sine of pi over 4 are both 1 over root 2, and then when you square that, you get a half. So this ends up being negative 4 times a half plus 4 times a half, but that's just 0. So, so far so good if I, th if I go back up to what we're trying to do, right? This here, we're trying to evaluate this at pi over 4. So far I got that it's 0 in the numerator and all that has to happen is that the denominator be any real number other than 0. 
So let's just make sure that happens. Um, let's evaluate this at pi over 4. So when you plug that in, you get 8 cosine of pi over 4 mine, uh, times, uh, actually, let's put, that, let's put this negative in front with the 8, times the sine of pi over 4. And you end up getting negative 8 times 1 over root 2 times 1 over root 2, which is 1 half, which is negative 4. And this ends up being 0, just as we predicted. And um, <clears throat> so there, it's kind of a lot of work when you think about it, just to find that one slope. But, I mean, it does work. And um, it's, again, in, in a situation where we're actually using par uh, parametric equations here. It's just that our parameters, parameters theta. Before you go, you should reflect on a couple of the derivatives that showed up. dy d theta is the rate of change of the y-coordinate with respect to theta. And if you think about it, this moment on the circle, that is an instant in which the y-coordinate is neither increasing or decreasing. And so it makes sense that its value is, is 0 right at that instant. Whereas dx d theta is negative 4, and that indicates that this circle is being traced uh, in the counterclockwise direction. And right at that instant, the x-coordinate is, is moving to the left um, at a rate of 4 units per unit time. So anyway, there's many other derivatives to talk about, but dy dx is always the slope of the tangent line, and that's what we found. And I'll leave you with one that you should try. Um, what I'll do is I'll graph it, and uh, I'll tell you what the answers are, and you can check it using your, uh, using your, your calculus. But r equals 1 minus cosine theta would have this graph um, that I'm about to sketch. And the, the, it says find the points on the cardioid, cardioid at which there is a vertical tangent. Well, you can see there's a vertical tangent here. Okay, so the answer should be theta equal to, um, theta equal to pi. Right, because when you plug in pi, that's the point that gets plotted. Right, so I would imagine theta equal to pi will show up. Theta equal to zero will show up. However, that's not going to be an answer because when theta is zero, it's where this cusp is. So theta equal to zero will show up as a critical point, but you need to ignore that because there's, there's, there's not a vertical tangent there. There's a cusp. Okay, so as you're doing this problem, just note that. And then it looks like um, that you have a vertical tangent that happens to be tangent to the cardioid twice at two different angles. And those angles turn out to be 60 degrees and 300 degrees. In other words, theta equal to pi over 3 will show up, and theta equal to 5 pi over 3. All right? even though that's one tangent line, the points of tangency, the points of tangency are there. Okay, so as you're doing this problem, those are the values that you show up for theta. It does say find the points on the cardioid, so it doesn't say what what system to use, so you might as well just um, write them in polar form. But in any case, uh, those are the guys that should show up, so try doing the calculus with this problem and see if, uh, if those do show up.